Good morning, girls. Grade eight. A very good morning to you all. And um, they, uh, this week is twenty eighth week of uh, our academic session. Okay, so we are having. Uh, we are almost at the end of the term, and this is the uh, second last reading story that we are going to take. It's not actually a story, this one. This is uh, from the invention of everything else. So why is this appearing? Girls, just hold on. Okay, so we are having uh, from the invention of everything else by Samantha Hunt. And this is uh, a novel excerpt. It is on page number. 494. Okay, so this is by Samantha, Her, uh, Samantha Hunt. Uh, she was born in 1971. She is an American novelist, essayist, and short story writer. Her award-winning stories and essays have appeared in many prestigious publications, including the New York, The New Yorker, New York Times Magazine, the Esquire. In 2006, she won the National Book Foundation's Five Under 35 Award, which each year honors five young fiction writers for their excellence. So she is a kind of achiever. She is a great writer and an, uh, you can say a novelist. And in this novel, they, we are taking just the excerpt. That's the reason we call it from the invention because why do we call it from the invention? Because it has been taken from the novel, The Invention of Everything Else. So basically, let me take the end. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. So basically, the uh, from The Invention of Everything, The Invention of Everything Else is a... It is, uh, good morning, sweetheart. Good morning, Tala. It is a novel. Okay, now this novel, why, uh, like, addresses what kind of subject and who is it written on. So we will see on the go. Now, let's see. Let's re read the background and then we'll understand more about what kind of novel is it. In her novel, Samantha Hearn imagined the last days in the life of Nikola Tesla from the perspective of the famous inventor. Now she's writing this novel from his own perspective as if Nikola Tesla was writing it for himself. This excerpt refers to Guglielmo Marconi. This, now this excerpt, this piece from the novel that we're going to read is about, um, it refers to Guglielmo Mar Marconi an inventor who sent the first wireless signal across an ocean and received a Nobel Prize for his work in 1911. However, he did so by using many key inventions that were initially developed by Nikola Tesla. Okay, so we what I think is that Nikola Tesla was being was being betrayed, was uh, cheated upon several times, as you can as you have read the previously, like in the previous lesson that we took about Nikola Tesla. It was a very brief description of him and his uh, life. In that mm -hmm. one, we saw that he was really betrayed by uh, a Thomas Edison, who actually uh, joked with him, who used him uh, in a wrong way, okay? And who later on took all the credit 
for what Nicola had done for his company. And that's what, that was the reason that Nicola left his job. And that was the reason that Nicola was uh, not recognized by the people because all the credit was gone to the Thomas Edison and his company. So that's the reason uh, uh, once he was betrayed, when once he was cheated, and it was, it is the second time, like that, that's the reason that they showed this excerpt, that it was another time that Guillermo Marconi, he took his idea and, and worked on it, and uh, like all the credit got, uh, got uh, like uh, associated with his name instead of Nikola Tesla. So let's see. Good morning, Judy. Now we have vocabulary. Before I move on to the uh, uh, to reading the excerpt itself, let's see the vocabulary. The first word will, is deficiencies. The second is strength, and and the third is revolutionize. So what does deficiencies mean? It is a noun first of all, and it means the state of being incomplete or lack of something. Okay, so when you're incomplete, when you are lacking something, when something is missing in you or in anything, it is called a deficiency. And the plural is deficiency. Deficiencies are all the things that we miss out. Number two is strength, which is a noun. It means victory or success. Number three is revolutionize, which is a verb. It means to bring a radical change about. Okay, so when you bring a radical change uh, into something, it is called revolutionize. It is called to revolutionize. And now, it's not just a small or minor change. It's a big change. Okay. Now, let's move on to the excerpt itself. So, we have here that this excerpt is as if Nicola is writing uh, a diary. Okay. Lightning first, then the thunder. And in between the two, I'm reminded of a secret. I was a boy and there was a storm. The storm said something muffled, try and catch me, perhaps. And then it bent down close to my ear in the very same way my brother Jane used to do, whispering a hot, damp breath, a turn between his mouth and my ear. The storm began to speak. You want to know what the storm said? Listen. Things like that, talking storms, happen to me frequently. Take, for example, the dust here in my hotel room. Each particle says something as it drifts through the last rays of sunlight, pale blades that have cut their way past my closed curtain. Look at this stuff. It is everywhere. Here is the tiniest bit of a woman from Bath Beach who had, their, who had her hair styled two days ago, loosening a small flakes of scarf in the process. Two days it took her to arrive. But here she is at last. She had to come because the hotel where I live is likely to stick tongue of a frog jutting out high above Manhattan, collecting the city particle by wandering part by 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 wandering particle. Here is some chimney ash. Here is some buck buckwheat flour blown in from a Portuguese bakery on Minota Lane, and a pellicle of curled felt belonging to the haberdashery around the corner. Here is a speck of evidence from a shy, uh, from a shy craft inspector. Maybe he lived in the borough of Queens. Maybe a respiratory influenza. One second. Uh, a respiratory influenza killed him off in 1897. So many maybes, and yet he is still here. And of course, no, I am, uh, one second. Yeah. And of course, uh, where, is, where was I? Yeah. So am I, Nikola Tesla, Serbian world famous inventor, once celebrated, once visited by kings, authors, artists, welterweight pugilists, uh, scientists of all strife, journalists with their prestigious awards, ambassadors, mezzo-sopranos and ballerinas, and I would shout down to the dining hall captain for a feast to be assembled. Quickly, bring us the stuffed saddle of spring lamb, bring us the mousse of lemon sole and the shed rose 
shadow bell manure, potatoes, raclette, string beans, soil, macadamia nuts, a nice bourbon, some tonic, some pep, uh, some pure nectar, coffee, teas, and please, please make it fast. So he is describing his condition, his situation when he was famous and a lot of people visited him. He is, this, is, this paragraph is all about description of his current situation as he says that uh, the dust in his room talks to him. So he actually talks to the particles that are around him. He feels them and he uh, notices where they're coming from. And then at the same time, he is describing how he used to eat and uh, sit and dine with a lot of famous and uh, well-known people. Okay, so here we go. That was some time ago. That was some time ago. Now, more regularly, no one visits. I sip at my vegetable broth, listening for a knock on the door or even footsteps approaching down the hall, hallway. Most often, it turns out to be a chambermaid on her rounds. I have been forgotten here, left alone, talking to lightning storms, studying the mysterious patterns the dust of dead people makes as it floats through the last light of day. Now that I have lived in the Hotel New Yorker far longer than any of the tourists or businessmen in town for a meeting, the homogeneity, the, homoge uh, the, the homogeneity of my room, a quality most important to any hotel decor, has all but worn off. Ten years ago, when I first moved in, I constructed a wall of shelves. It still spans floor to ceiling. The wall consists of 77, 15 inch tall drawers as well as a number of small cubby holes to fill up the odd spaces. The top drawers are so high off the ground off the ground that even I at over six feet tall feet tall am forced to keep a wooden step stool behind the closet door to access them. Each drawer is stained a deep brown and is differentiated from others by a small card of identification taped to the front. The label the labels have yellowed under the adhesive, copper wire, correspondence, magnets, perpetual, motion, mist. He is describing the room that he has been living in for so long. He said that he has been living in the hotel for longer than any other tourist that was at, in the, uh, at the hotel. And he's describing the room. He said that I have lived here so long that even the things in my room, the shelves, the drawers and everything have worn out. It looks like they are so much used. And these were the tags that were on the, that were sticked on his drawer. So you can see what kind of things he had uh, in his uh, room. And uh, he is alone now, no one visits him and no one comes to see him and he actually waits for people <clears throat> drawer 42 it sticks and it sticks and creaks with the weather this is the drawer where i once thought i'd keep all my best ideas it contains only some cracked peanut shells it is too dangerous to write my best ideas down whoops Wrong drawer. Whoops! I repeat the word. It's one of the. It's one of my favorites. If it were possible, I'd store whoops in this safe by my bed, along with OK and sure thing and the documents that prove that I'm officially an American citizen. Drawer fifty-three. Drawer number fifty-three is empty, though inside I detect the slightest odor of ozone. I sniff the drawer, inhaling deeply. Ozone is not what I'm looking for. I close 53 and open number 26. Inside there is a press clipping, something somebody once said about my works. Humanity will be like an anthea stirred, with, a stirred up with a stick. See the excitement coming? The, the excitement apparently already came and went. That is not what I'm looking for. Somewhere in one of the 77. So what is he looking for in the drawers? Somewhere in one of the 77 drawers, I have a clipping. So, so he had 77 number of drawers in his room that he got built by, the, by himself. 
that was not provided by, by the hotel, of course. I have a clipping from an article published in the New York Times. The article includes a photo of the inventor Guglielmo Marconi riding on the shoulders of men, a loose white scarf held in his raised <clears throat> left hand, flagging debris. All day thoughts of Marconi have been poking me in the, in the ribs. They often do whenever I feel particularly low or lonely or poorly financed. I shut my eyes and concentrate on sending Marconi a message. The message is, Marconi, you are a thief. I focus with great concentration until I can mentally access the radio waves. As the invisible waves advance through my head, I attach a few words to each, donkey and worm and limousine, which is an adjective that I only recently acquired the meaning of, like a slug. When I'm certain that the words are fixed to the radio waves, I send the words off towards, towards Marconi because he has stolen my patent. He has stolen my invention of radio. He has stolen my notoriety. Not that either of us deserved it. Invention is nothing a man can own. And so I am resigned out of the window to the ledge. 33 stories above the street, I go legs first. This is no small feat. I am no small man. Imagine an oversized skeleton. I have to wonder what a skeleton that fell 33 stories down to the street below would look like. I take one tentative glance toward the ground. Years ago, power lines would have stretched across the block and a mad cobweb, a net, because years ago, any company that wanted to provide New York with electricity simply sprung its own decentralized power lines all about the city before promptly going out of business or getting forced out by JP Morgan. But now there is no net. The power lines have been hidden underground. That's not why I have come here. I have, to, I have no interest in jumping. I'm not resigned to die. Most certainly not. No, I'm resigned only to leave humans to their humanness. Die? No, indeed. I've always planned to see the far side of 125. I am only 86. I have got 39 more years at least. Woohoo! The birds answered the call. Gray flight surrounds me and the reverse swing of so many pairs of wings. Some iridescent, some a bit duller, makes me dizzy. The birds slow to a landing before me. Beside me, one or two perching directly on the top of my shoulders and head. Mesmerized by their feathers, such engineering, I lose my balance. Like the way they fly and the way they balance themselves. So here he is talking about how the birds, he is talking about their, uh, their ability to balance, to fly. And it's so mesmerizing. So actually, now girls, uh, Nikola Tesla is uh, in the in the previous page. On the previous page, we saw that he talked mainly about how Galileo Marconi stole his idea. His it was his idea. It was his invention. And he said that if I could ever send him a message, I would say that you are a thief. And he is really depressed. He is kind of. Like he is, uh, like Marconi and uh, Thomas Edison. Actually, they flourished. Their business flourished. They were rich. They were famous. They were known. They were, uh, their name were published in newspapers, magazine, and everywhere. So, uh, on the other hand, Nikola Tesla lived there all alone in a hotel room at the age of eighty-six, and he had no one to come to even see him. That's how miserable his life beca became at the at the last like in the last years before before dying. So we see that uh, some people are never are never given their rights. He deserved everything. He deserved all the fame and name and and of course the richness that comes along. But he never had it. He died penniless. He had nothing. The only friends that he had were those birds that used to come over his wind, uh, window. I lose my balance. The ledge is perhaps only 45 centimeters wide. My shoulders lurch forward a bit. 
just enough to notice the terrific solidity of the sidewalk, 33 stories down, like a gasp for air. I pin my back into the cold stone of the window's casing. A few pigeons startle and fly away out over 8th Avenue across Manhattan. Catching my breath, I watch them go. I watch them disregard gravity, the ground and the distance between us. And though an old of feeling, one of the wings haunts my shoulder blade. I stay pinned to the window. I have learned that I cannot go with them. Out on the ledge of them of my room, I maintain a small infirmary for injured and geriatric pigeons, like th those who were sick. A few tattered, uh, tattered boxes, some shredded newspaper. One new arrival hobbles on a foot that has been twisted into an energy knuckle. A pink stump. I see she wants nothing more to do with the hydrogen peroxide that bubbled fiercely in her wound last night. I let her be, squatting instead of uh, instead to finger the underside of another bird's wing. Beneath his fling, the ball of his joint has finally stayed lodged in its orbit, and for this I'm relieved. I turn my attention to mashing meal. So he he actually checks the one of the pigeons if if, if uh, she's fine, and then he moves to his meal. Hello, dears. The air of New York is high up, smells gray with just a hint of blue. I sniff the air. It's getting chilly. Hmm. I ask the bird. So he's actually talking to the bird. And what are your plans for the new year tonight? The hotel has been in a furor, preparing for the festivities all week. The birds say nothing. No plans yet. No, me neither. I stand looking out into the darkening air. Who? It's just a question. I stare up in the sky, wondering if she will show tonight. Having lived in America for 59 years, I have nearly perfected my relationships with the pigeons, the sparrows, and the starlings of the New York City. Particularly the pigeons. Humans remain a far greater challenge. So, do you see how, what kind of, uh, what kind of, uh, like, environment, atmosphere became around him? Like, he was left alone so much that he only had pigeons to talk to. And he was afraid of humans. Perhaps he lost trust. I sit on the ledge with the birds for a long while, waiting for her to appear. It is getting quite cold. At the last rays of sun disappear from the sky, the undersides of the clouds glow with the memory of the light. Then they don't anymore. And what was once clear becomes less so in the darkening sky. The bricks and stones of the surrounding building take on a deeper hue. A bird cuts across the periphery of my sight. I don't allow myself to believe it might be her. Hoo hoo, don't look. I caution my heart. It won't be her. I took, I take a look just the same. A gorgeous checkered, his hackle purple and green. It's not her. She is pale gray with white tipped wings. And into her eyes, Sorry, and into her uh, 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 and into her ear, I have whispered all my doubts. Through the years, I've told her of my childhood, the books I read, a history of Serbian battle songs, dreams of earthquakes, endless meals and islands, inventions, lost notions, love, architecture, poetry, a bit of everything. We have been together since I don't remember when. I lo a long while, though it makes no sense. I think of her as my wife, or at least something like a wife, in as much as any inventor could ever have a wife, in as much as a bird who can fly could ever love a man who can't. So he's, uh, he's considering a pigeon, a female pigeon, as his wife, because he has shared with that pigeon every story that he could, because he had no humans around to talk to. Most regularly, she allows me to smooth the top of her head and neck with my point, pointer finger. She even encourages it. I run my finger over her feathers and feel the small bones of her head. The delicate cage made of calcium built to protect the bit of magnetite she keeps inside. 
this miraculous mineral powers my system of alternating current electrical distribution. It also gives these birds direction, pulling north, creating an, a compass in their bodies, ensuring that they always know the way home. Do you see? So, like the brains in a pigeon, uh, the brain of a pigeon is like a magnet, and that's how it actually pulls pulls them towards their home. They know where they know which direction to move on. And it is revealed by, um, here it is revealed by uh, Nicola. I have not seen my own home in 35 years. There is no home anymore. Everyone is gone. My torn town of, of Smiljan in what was once like Lika, then Croatia, now Yugoslavia. I don't have wings. I tell the birds who are perched beside me on the ledge, I don't have magnetite in my head. These deficiencies punish me daily, particularly as I get older and recall Smiljan smil smil with, inc with increasing frequency. When I was a child, I had a tiny laboratory that I had constructed in an alcove of trees. I nailed tin candle sconces to the trunk so that I could work on into the night while the candle's glow crept up the orange bark and filled my laboratory with odd shadows the stretch fingers of pine needles as they shifted and grew in the wind. There is one invention from that time, one of my fav one of my very first, that serves as a measure for how the purity of thought can dwindle with age. Once I was clever, once I was seven years old, the invention came to me like this. Smiljan is a very tiny town surrounded, surrounded by mountains and rivers and trees. My house was part of a farm where we raised animals and grew vegetables. Beside our home was a church where my father was a minister. In this circumscribed natural setting, my ears were my ears were attuned to a different species of sounds. Footsteps approaching on the dirt path, raindrops falling on the hot back of a ho of a horse, leaves browning. One night, from outside my bedroom window, I heard a terrific buzzing noise, the rumble of a thousand insects' wings beating in concert. I recognized the noise immediately. It signaled the seasonal return of what people in Smithland called Maybugs, what people in America called June bugs. The insect motions, their constant energy, kept me awake through the night, considering plotting and scheming. I rolled in my bed with the possibility these insects presented. Finally, just before the sun rose, I sneaked outside while my, fa fa my, while my family slept. I carried a glass jar my mother usually used for storing stewed vegetables. The jar was nearly as large as my rib cage. I removed my shoes. The ground was still damp. I walked barefoot through the paths of town, stopping at every low tree and shrub, the leaves of which were alive with June bugs. Their brown bodies hummed and crawled in masses. They made my job of collection quite easy. I harvested the beetle crop, sometimes collecting as many as 10 insects per leaf. The bugs shell shells make made a hard click when they struck against a glass or against another bug. So plentiful was the supply that the jar was filled to brimming in no time. All right, good. So uh, we will read from here in the next session. Okay, so let's uh, meet again and then I'll uh, do the worksheet along with the latter part of the, the lecture.